This is the a7 IV. If you're on the fence about buying this camera, I want to give you my initial impressions after using this for a few days and hopefully help you decide whether or not this is a worthwhile upgrade if you're shooting on the a7 III or if you're looking to get your first Sony camera, is this the one you should get? Hey, my name's Jake and I create content here to help solo creators on the go. So I want to give you my initial impressions after using this camera for a few days and running it through a whole lot of different situations. I will have a full review coming as well as a setup and tutorial and a comparison between this and the a7 III and the a7S III so that you can decide what the best camera might be for you. So if you want to see those videos, make sure you subscribe so that you can be notified uh, and hit the bell so you can be notified when I post those videos. But for now, this is my initial first impressions of this incredible hybrid camera. Because this has a new 33 megapixel sensor from Sony, I really wanted to test out the photo quality and see how good they are, how editable they are, how much memory they take, and just what the dynamic range is, and just in general, how good is the quality of the photos coming out of this camera. I worked with the a7 III for years, and they were great, but they definitely had some limitations. I used the a7S III, I've used the a9, the a1, I've used a lot of different Sony cameras, and I really wanted to see if this is truly kind of an all, a do-it-all camera, a hybrid, where you can shoot photos and video equally and run around. And I gotta say, so far, I've been blown away by the quality. Now, obviously, it's 33 megapixels, so your data for each photo, at least in RAW, which is what I shoot, is about 35 megabytes, which is not bad, but it definitely ends up in this time lapse here. I ended up shooting about 1,400 photos, a little over 1,400 photos, so that was a lot of data. But, uh, as you can see, they're exceptional and beautiful images, and it really does well in the interval mode um, in shooting. Now, also because it's 33 megapixels, it gives you a fair amount of room to crop in and post if you want to. So here I was not standing, I mean, this was shot with a 24 to 105. I wasn't standing nearly as close to this as it looks, but you're able to crop in and get a little bit closer. If I'd had a much more telephoto lens, probably could have gotten a shot of just the eye of this mountain goat, but, uh, yeah, the 33 megapixel photos are really very nice and they edit really well in Lightroom if you're shooting in RAW. The JPEGs look nice too, but they just don't give you as much room or as much space in post to be able to edit. And that's where we come to the video quality. Now, shooting 30 frames a second, this having 10-bit 422, 10-bit and 422 is so fantastic. The XAVC-S and the XAVC-I codecs are great. I use XAVC-S because it compresses a little bit. My computer doesn't have any problems handling decompressing that footage, and it doesn't take up as much space on the card. But you, being able to shoot 4K in 10-bit uh, is just fantastic, and it looks really good. I would say the video on this looks a little better than my A7S III because it's downsampling that much larger, like around 6K, 7K sensor down to 4K. So the 4K on this looks just absolutely fantastic. And the cool thing is that they've now given us 4K at up to 60 frames a second. The downside of that is that you, it does crop in, it does go in 1.4, 1.5 times to APS-C mode to be able to read the data off the sensor fast enough to be able to do 4K 60, but you can still do it in 10-bit and it's still 422. And it does look good. And I don't mind shooting 4K60 in uh, you know, APS-C mode because I don't shoot it that often. It's really just when I wanna do some B-roll or maybe try and get a little bit longer shot that's extra smooth when I'm shooting things handheld. And so if you know that you're gonna crop in 1.5 times when you're shooting it, you just compensate and reframe so that it's what you need or what you want. But yeah, the 4K60 and the 4K30 out of this are fantastic. Now, SNQ mode works too. You get HD120. The HD120 out of this is much better than the HD120 was out of the a7 III, as far as I can tell. But yeah, the quality is, is really good. The video quality has taken a substantial jump over the a7 III, um, and it just, it's really nice. I think this might become my new kind of general take everywhere with me camera um, because it really performs well. When it comes to low light, I've been pretty spoiled. The a7S III is a phenomenal low light camera. I mean, I've gone out and shot myself in nothing but moonlight and the a7S III can do it, which is kind of mind blowing. This can do it sort of, but the difference is that this starts to fall apart earlier. Now, up until you get up into like the 20,000, a little bit higher than 20,000 ISO range, this actually looks really good and does as well, or maybe in some cases even better than the a7S III. 
But once you get above 20,000, 40,000 range, it definitely starts to get a lot worse than the A7S III. So this does really well in low light, but if you're going for like extremely low light situations, AKA filming yourself under the stars in the moonlight, then the A7S III is still the way to go. But, uh, but frankly, I was really surprised. I mean, if you're not filming yourself in the middle of the night, this camera does really well in low light. And even in photos here, you can see I was shooting, this is 32, uh, 3200 ISO, and it's really clean. It, I mean, there is some noise, but it's really super clean still. So the low light on this camera is really great. The autofocus on the last few Sony models has been just incredible. It grabs your eye, it grabs your face, it does really, really well. And this is no exception. It does an incredible job of tracking your eye, tracking your face in a lot of different scenarios and situations. I noticed it does grab your eye faster than even the A7S III does. Uh, it, it just, it does a fantastic job. And a couple of things about the autofocus is one, not only is it super sticky, like I would have no problem shooting an interview with this and just let it be on autofocus and follow somebody through the interview. On the focus system, Sony added something called focus breathing compensation. The camera will automatically compensate for the focus breathing, which is incredible because the G Master Primes have a lot of focus breathing. Being able to compensate for that and shoot at 1.4 on the, on the 24 millimeter and not have any focus breathing in the video is absolutely phenomenal. And I really hope Sony brings that to the rest of their like A7S III or the A1 because that's just, it's awesome. While this has the same body as the A7S III, which I really like because it feels comfortable in the hand, it's easy to hold, and I love the individual doors that flap open, you know, for your mic port and your recharging. This is power delivery on USB-C 2, so it'll recharge the battery fast, and a full-size HDMI port, which is awesome. Um, <laughs> the, all these little controls. I love the fact that they copy the A7S III body and then you've got the flip out screen, which is so nice if you're a solo creator and you're filming yourself or you're even filming other people, but you've got to kind of make sure you get things set before other people come in. Having a flip out screen is great. This one feels a little more solid than the A7S III did. So I don't know if they made some changes there or not, but one of my favorite things is not only do you have a lot of customizable buttons, just like the A7S III, you can now customize the auto exposure, you know, compensation dial to be pretty much whatever you want. I haven't really messed with it yet because I don't know what I'm going to end up using it for. That'll be in the setup and settings video. But uh, the fact that you can customize that now is awesome. And then one of my favorite things is you have this little jog wheel here that switches between photo, video, and S and Q modes. And because you have three different memory recall settings or memory settings, you actually have like nine because if you switch to photo mode, you can go to memory one. You can set that to be whatever. Mine's not actually set up, it's JPEGs. Memory two is my raw photo shooting mode. Memory three is my interval shooting mode. And then if I switch to video, now this becomes memory three is 4K60 in S-Log3. Memory two is 4K30 in S-Log3, the main thing I shoot in. And then memory one is 4K in standard color profile, which I do shoot in sometimes like in situations like this. And then if you switch to S and Q mode, again, you have all three memory settings that are individual. That's amazing because basically I can't imagine when you'd actually have to go into the menu now and adjust anything. You have basically everything you need right there being able to switch. And the switching between those modes is insanely fast. Like it's almost instant. Another thing that is really awesome about this is the fact that the shutter curtain can be set to close for when you switch lenses. That is awesome. I don't know if there's a way to get that in the A1 and the A7S III, but I hope so because being able to protect your sensor when you're changing out lenses is incredible. The battery life on this seems to be as good I think a little, a little better even than my A7S III. Even in the cold, it's done a little bit better. I just feel like, the, you know, not a lot, 10, 15, maybe 15% better, but it definitely is a little better. One thing you will want to do if you just get yours is go down to page 48. Uh, so you go to page 40 and then you go over and you go to 48, oh, 49. And if you go down to auto power off temperature, you want to set that to high. 
because otherwise the camera will power off thinking it's overheating a lot earlier than it actually needs to. I haven't had any issues with overheating. This thing has been running. Granted, I'm operating in the middle of winter in Alaska, so it's hard to get anything to overheat outdoors, but I have used this to film some stuff in here and to live stream with for an hour, a little over an hour at a time, and it hasn't had any issues, so. And then one last thing that I like and sort of don't like is one, you can use, this is a, is this a UHS-2? No, this isn't even a UHS-2, but it's just a SanDisk Extreme Pro 128 gigabyte. And I can film 4K 30 10 bit and 4K 60 10 bit on that card, no problem. And then having the top slot be CF Express Type A or uh, SD, and both of them are UHS up to US, UHS-2 compatible means that you can do a lot of data and then also transfer the data off those cards really fast, which is nice. I wish they'd done kind of the same thing with the A1 and the A7S III where both of them were CF Express Type A or SD, but the fact that the SD card slot two is a UHS-2 really makes a huge difference. And uh, you know, you can shoot 4K 30, 10 bit and 4K 60 10 bit and not have to worry too much about buying really expensive CF Express Type A cards. I think this is going to become my new daily shooter, the, the camera that I take out with me pretty much everywhere. Unless I'm going to extremely low light situations, then the a7S III is still better for that. But th this thing is uh, incredible. A worthy upgrade to the a7 III for sure. And um, a, I think probably going to be one of the best kind of hybrid photo and video cameras on the market for 2500 bucks. If you're interested in purchasing one, there are links in the description. If you have questions, ask me in the comments below. I'll do my best to answer them. If you want to see what lenses work really well with Sony cameras, I put together a small playlist right here. I'll see you in one of those videos. As always, you can ask me questions in the comments or you can join my live stream, which happens Wednesday nights at 4 p.m. Alaska time or 8 p.m. Eastern time. Until uh, I see you in the next videos I put out about this camera, I'll see you again soon. Cheers.